of the goals of constructing this purpose-built coral farm was to grow Acropora better than what we were doing up to that point in the greenhouse. Did we succeed? Let's dive right into some comparisons. Why Acropora specifically? Acros are one of the most sensitive corals. Every little change in the system can impact their growth and coloration. It's why stick heads sweat out all the little details because those little details are the difference between that expensive tenius expressing that third or fourth color or not. For example, if you look at this fuchsia highlight on the ridge of each coralite on a home wrecker acro, that little highlight can be really elusive. And if one chemical parameter goes out of spec, it's going to lose that highlight and it might stay gone for a good long time after that chemistry situation has been corrected. We've had the greenhouse since 2002 and it's been great for a lot of corals, but it's not great for the ones requiring ultra stability. So a lot of what went into the design of this new place is to bridge that gap of stability. That's really the main goal. I am kind of curious to take this look back and to see if we were in fact successful with it. Let's talk about the specific areas of change that contributed to this newfound success with Acros, and let's see if there's some that you can implement into your systems. I realize that going from a greenhouse to a new aquaculture coral farm, not super relatable for a lot of folks, but I think that there are some nuggets that will apply. So what changed? Perhaps the biggest thing for us is something that people with home aquariums don't really need to stress out a lot over, and that's just controlling temperature. In the greenhouse system, it is simply not the best insulated building out there, and most people with the greenhouse don't exactly heat them during the winter. That's obviously not going to work so well for us. We have to provide heating for these aquariums, but there's only so much you can really do. We live in Ohio, and on the coldest winter days, you're talking about potentially negative 10. It can get really cold. In fact, there was a time when it got so cold that I had to install an alarm to let me know when the furnace froze over so that I could go out there, chip off the ice, and restart it. There were plenty of nights where I went to sleep knowing full well that at 3 a.m. I'm going to hear an alarm and have to get up, get a hammer, get out there and start like bash away at some ice that forms around the exhaust. That's how ridiculous it used to be. Things have improved with the new building. So you can imagine, in a world where that sort of thing happens, temperatures might not be ideal for something that's looking for rock solid stability. That's one of the biggest things about the new building. The temperatures are absolutely rock solid. I don't think that the temperatures in the aquariums themselves fluctuate by more than one degree at any point in the year. As horrific as those winters sound, in reality, the winter is the easy part. Summertime is way more difficult. Cooling down tanks has always been more challenging than heating them up. So there have been plenty of weeks where the temperature is over 90 something degrees and that can be a real challenge. There's only so much that you're actually able to do in a greenhouse setting. Next big thing, control of light. In a greenhouse, the whole point is to take advantage of the light. Now, in theory, that sounds great, but in practice, it's very inconsistent. Obviously, going from day to day, you might have sunny days, you might have cloudy days, but worse yet, you have seasonality where in the summertime, the sun simply stays in the sky for what seems to be eight hours longer than what it does in the winter. Those sorts of major fluctuations, they don't do great things for corals that are looking for extreme consistency. Another big difference is our ability to control nutrient levels. One would think feeding, filtration, it's a pretty simple balance, but a greenhouse versus a new building like this, it is a open structure. It allows in pretty much anything that wants to wander in, squirrels, whatever the heck, right? I kind of joke, but the amount of bugs that end up in the water is significant. But you know what's even more significant? 
for those of you out there that have allergies, you already know, it's pollen. Come springtime and then later in fall, there is simply heaps of pollen that get dumped into these tanks. And a lot of times that simply overwhelms your filtration system. So there's certainly different seasons where I can tell that a lot of the corals in the greenhouse are struggling and it's just because of that loss of control of nutrients. Piggybacking on the nutrient discussion. So we talked about the issues with nutrient removal, but there's also the element of nutrient input in feeding. One thing about our old system is that since there are so many variables, it was very challenging to kind of figure out what the effect of any new thing that we did was. Like, what is the impact of any new change? All these different variables are constantly shifting under our feet. So when we try something new and we get, let's say, good results, was it because of this new thing or was it just because the weather changed? If we get some bad results, was it because we tried this new thing or was it because all of a sudden we had heaps of pollen dumped into our tanks? It was always difficult to tell. But now that we have a lot of those variables ironed out in this new building, one of the changes that we did make that seems to make a huge impact when it comes to acros is feeding. We started to feed amino acids. Specifically in our case here, we went with aquavitra fuel and we set this baseline we had a very stable, long-running system, and we got very comfortable knowing what those corals looked like. And so when we started to do our feeding, I would say that within 48 hours, we could tell a big difference, and then we just kept it going. Now we have probably the most insane polyp extension on our acropora that we've ever seen. This is a total anecdote, not sponsored by, by Seachem, but we're very happy so far with Aquavitra Fuel. If you have a favorite amino acid supplement, by all means, keep that going. Here and there, we will definitely be trying others, but as of right this second, we're using fuel. Another big change going from greenhouse to new coral farm is the overall system volume. Out there, we had systems in the ballpark of 1,000 gallons. Smallest one might've been 800 gallons, Biggest one, probably a thousand. In the new building, they're all about 2,500 gallons. I think that the greater system volume tends to help. It's hard to say. Sometimes our smaller aquariums that we have out there in the new building, they tend to do better for certain corals. But there is something to be said for having these very large systems that have one single point where you're trying to maintain certain parameters and you just do it all at once. And it's kind of nice. Instead of having like a whole bunch of smaller systems, you just manage one system. Theoretically, it's going to be more stable and less susceptible to major chemical changes. But it wasn't like a thousand gallons was ever small. So it, that, I'm kind of on the fence on that. It is significantly larger. I mean, it's more than double the size. One last thing that I'll mention, and this is a pretty big one, is the improvement in flow. I've never been super happy with the flow in any of our systems. Over our entire stretch out there in the greenhouse, we've always had chronically low flow. Compared to what we have now, I think that in our farming systems in the new building, it's pretty much night and day. We're running these closed loops, which are really nice. As time goes on, the idea really was to really lean heavily into closed loops, but I think that we might still want to add a little bit more flow because I'm starting to see flow slow down as the colonies get larger. Originally, when things were just smaller frags, wasn't a big deal, but now we actually have chunks of coral and that over time kind of like suffocates your flow. I've got a couple of ideas on how to get more flow through our closed loops, but I think that the real solution is just going to be adding more power heads. We were trying to avoid the power head thing because it's a little bit more of a snake pit as far as wiring goes, but I think that in the future we can go with a completely different setup for a lot of the electronics and keep a lot of that stuff very streamlined. But those future improvements aside, I think the improvements that we've made up to this point have made a big difference in what we're seeing with our acros now.
All right, guys, that pretty much does it from here. I think the most important takeaway from all this is being able to get stuff rock solid. People always say stability, 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 like it's some cliche. It really does work, guys. The devil, however, is in the details. Oftentimes, stability isn't the easiest thing to achieve. There's a lot of ways to get there. The important thing is to kind of find something that works for your system, something that you can keep up with, and stick with it. So anyway, hope you guys found something helpful out of this, and I'll see you all next time. Happy reefing.